Hello everybody, hope you're doing marvellously well. Here we are, we're at Sunset Sound, which apparently in 1962 was opened, and 50 years later it was 2012. <laughs> okay, so it's been open 55 whopping years. Um, this is a really great day. So what we have is we have Jonah Smith, and for those of you that maybe know, he was a semi-finalist on uh, America's Got Talent. He's a really incredible piano vocalist, and We've got two of my favorite guys in the world, Blair Sinter playing drums and John Button playing bass. Blair plays with everybody, was in Alanis' band. Um, John currently is the uh, bass player for The Who. These are wonderful musicians. Jonah is an amazing songwriter and has got a beautiful voice. So we're gonna go in and we're gonna track a song live. What else is exciting about this is we're gonna use all of the beautiful equipment that Sunset has. We're gonna use their fantastic console. We're also gonna use 67s and 47s and gorgeous microphones and everything. But, and this is the thing that I'm really excited about, is we're gonna use a Focusrite 8PX as well, and we're gonna run eight mics on the drum kit. We're gonna have a pair of rooms and we're gonna use the other six on the kit. We're gonna record that simultaneously with the expensive mics so that we get a recording that will show off that it's a lot about a great room, great drum kit, and most importantly, a great drummer. Performance is king. And so thank you, Shaw. And I think their drum package total was like $500 for seven mics, and then the other two stereo, you know, the room mics that we're using in stereo, I think were like 100 bucks each. So we're talking about a $700 mic package and a Focusrite Octopri, which I think is about 1,000-ish. So total, that equipment going into a laptop is less than any one of those microphones. And a very, very loud car just went past. Anyway, so here we go. Let's go to, let's go to Studio 3 and let's check it all out. So, this is my favorite studio in the world. Love it dearly. Um, we'll do a quick walkthrough. Dum -de dum 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 dum. Control room already lit. Beautiful console. Um, it'll take you through that in a little bit. Absolutely amazing. Here's the live room. Just absolutely gorgeous. Piano's in there um, with the vocal mic, which is the SM58. And over here is where we're setting up the B15. There's John's B15. Um, this, strangely enough, is where they have a tape machine at the moment. This is actually like a little kitchenette. And uh, you can't really see it because there's no... Oh, oh, there is lighting in here. You see here, this is, this is from the 80s. A little kitchenette in here. And this was put in by Prince. He asked for it. When Prince was in here, he was in there for a few years and he had a bed in the live room here. And he made Purple Rain and 1999. He made these records here in this room and he lived in here for a few years while he was making the albums, which is pretty amazing. Okay, here is the Focusrite 8 Pre-X that we're using, which is uh, by Thunderbolt. So this is gonna be fantastic. And we're using the Shaw mics, which we'll take you through again, obviously, but uh, it's the seven mic drum package. So we have the condensers here. As you can see, they're lined up in phase with the U67s. We have on the top here and on the bottom, we didn't end up using the bottom snare mic because the Octopri is eight inputs, so we just elected to go overheads, snare top, and then we have, as you can see, strapped here, the microphones for the toms, and they're just strapped next to the 421s, sitting next door to the D112, is the Shure kick drum mic. And then for the room mic, we've got the PGA 181s. These are like, I wanna say they're a hundred bucks each. They're really cheap. So they're my floor mics. I've always, in this room in particular, I've always loved the way it sounds just miking the floor. So, you know, you've got, uh, you've got $3,000 worth of mics here and a good hundred dollars worth of mic here. So it's gonna be interesting. Above, up here, these are the high mics. I've got a pair of those in the room and uh, a 67 up on the wall here, which is miking the wall. And so that gets a reflected sound there. And that's being crushed with a distressor. 
So that's that's the basic room mics. Oh, and of course, you know, there's a 414 just in the room, which we're using for talk back, but we also record. And there's a lot of compression on this, so we can pick up everybody talking in the room. Um, now, the way it obviously was is there was piano over there, and he had a vocal mic so they could hear him talking, but then this mic here was to pick up Blair and John. The whole, this drum mic package, I believe, is $500, maybe a little bit more, top of my head, or flash pricing and below. Needless to say, whether it's 500 bucks or 600 bucks is kind of irrelevant. The, it's inexpensive, it's affordable for eight microphones that we're using. And this one beautiful U67 here is considerably more expensive than the Focusrite 8 Pre-X, a laptop to use it, and all the microphones. You could sell that, buy all of this other gear, and have change to go on vacation to probably Hawaii for a couple of weeks. So. The point is, is like, it's very inexpensive. This is gonna be about the drummer, the song obviously, but the drummer, primarily the drums, and of course this beautiful room. These are the key kind of points that we want to sort of talk about. Obviously I'm here to get the best results. So I'm gonna use a little bit of EQ and compression going in on the console. That's why the console's there. We can use plugins, etc., with the, um, in your DAW, to also mimic those kind of things as well. So we'll go through the settings there and you can mimic them. I am really confident that we're gonna get some fantastic results in here. Will we get exactly the same? I doubt it. I mean, I'll tell you why. We could take a U67 and we could put a Royer, a beautiful microphone, maybe a 122, and put it up alongside it. It's not gonna sound the same. It's gonna sound good and indifferent. That's the point. This is not about like, is, does this mic sound like this mic? It's more about like, will this microphone give you an amazing result? Will it give you a very usable result capturing a wonderful musician, playing a great drum kit on a great song in a great room? I mean, these are things that we have to be very mindful of. And you know, my motto is creativity is king. I firmly believe this, so it's gonna be very exciting. As far as the piano, it's the last thing we didn't really cover. It's obviously a Steinway. They have a Steinway, they have three Steinways at Sunset Sound, one in each room. It's a pair of U47s over the piano, spaced pair, and then a C12A, which is recording the frame. For those of you who've been following me, you'll know why I do that. Many, many years ago, I was over in Studio Two with Dave Sardi doing the Thrills record, and we had baffled off a piano and put a C12A over it to do scratch piano. And every day, we thought it sounded better and better. And when we came in, like on the last day, we pulled back the baffles and the mic had fallen down and had landed here and wasn't touching anything. And that was when it sounded its best. So now whenever I do mono piano, I just mic up the frame down there. It's a trick that I've seen a couple of people tell me they're like, that they, they got from me, you'll love it. Just a, you can use a 414, you can use anything to be honest, but that, that works really well with the capsule. Okay, so here is the console. We're in Studio 3, it's a Studio 3 console. This, um, this I have been told, if I'm probably wrong, because I always am, um, that this is the, um, first of the two consoles. It's kind of the prototype for Studio One. So it's like a year or so older. I love both of them. Personally love everything about this room. This is my favorite room to work in anywhere in the world. You've got a nice hangout area for the, you know, for the other band musicians down the front there. You've got a really nice, one of the best lounge I think in the place. You've got a great live room, best drum sound for me. There's an awesome room over here where you can put guitars and singers. It's got your own bathroom. Piano room, rooms to put bass guitar, guitar over. It's basically the room that you can just kind of work in and have a band and have them hang out and record them. Um, these are the uh, these are the um, Demidio mic pre's that are also in uh, console number one, studio number one, and they're phenomenal sounding. You can I think they actually make these now. You, they sell them, and you can buy the mic pre's. But anyway. So obviously got API EQs. So if we start over here, so we have a 414 out there, which is rolling as the talkback. Now the talkback is basically a very, very compressed mic that allows anybody in the room to talk and be heard and hear each other. But we're also, of course, we're not applying any EQ, but we're compressing it pretty heavily. 
with a distressor, but we're also printing this. It's like a, it's like the U67 mic, but it's it's really trashy and, and tons of energy. It's another one of those mics that you might just throw in there just for the heck of it, just to make it feel like a something's going on. It's another way of doing like, a lot of times people do parallel compression to sit, to emulate what this will do, but it's kind of fun. So it's, it's muted, but it's going out pre-fade. So it doesn't really matter. We're muting it because when it's printing straight directly out of the mic pre, bypassing everything else, and the mute here is just sending from fader to um, the playback there. It just means that I can unmute if I want to hear them talk or mute it, you know, when I, when I don't want this, the room mic to be blowing up in my mix, but it's not stopping it from going to tape, going to Pro Tools. We've got a kick in, the D112, and I'm driving it fairly hard. The way this works, if you can see this mic pre up here, is this is obviously the amount of gain from zero to 40. Um, this is minus up to zero, so that's the least on 40 and the most at zero. This plus or minus control here on the top is a, um, is a in 6 dB increment, so it's 6 dB minus or plus. So, you know, set there and center to temp where it is, I've just got 30 dB. So I can go up to 36 or I can go down to 24. So that's kind of a nice, and there's, there's a 10 dB uh, increment there. So if I went to 20, I could come, I could go up to 26. 30, I can go down to 24. So as you can see, it's full, it's full crossover. So it's, you know, there's no, some of the older mic pre's, which I love, like the Spectrasonics, the only problem with those is there wasn't that much, um, there wasn't much I could do between certain gain settings which is fine. Um, a lot of mic pre's were like that and they sound fantastic, but this is a little bit more finessing. All right, so what do I have going on? Minimal amount of EQ. As I explained, I came here to, to record a really great song. So I'm gonna use the API EQs. Now, obviously on the focus right, we're printing it flat, but you can open up, we'll use the Slate plugins. You can open up the Slate plugins and you can find you can find an EQ in there, which is an American style EQ, which they have, and will we'll mimic this kind of EQ setting. We don't have that available to print, and we're printing it clean. But, you know, we came here to make a great, great record. So I'm not trying to, I'm not gonna print and bypass EQ or compression. I'm gonna use it on the way in, because that is the way I get a great sound. I don't wanna go back and do it with a plugin when I've got the hardware. But what we're gonna try with the focus rides, we're gonna open it up and listen to those tracks and we'll apply the EQ and compression, which is comparable to what we've been doing here. That will give us an idea of how close we can get. Okay, so D112, EQ is 3 dB, cut at 400, which is pretty typical for me. If you know me, I'm a 350, 400 take out of drums and then a 3 dB boost at 50 hertz. Nothing magical. Any of you who've ever used API, Qs, API EQs, like 550As like this, will know that's a pretty typical thing to do on a kick drum. Okay, next up is uh, a 47, FET. No EQ whatsoever, just printing. That's the FET there that's on the um, outside of the kick. And I'm not doing any EQ, no, no compression whatsoever. The D112 actually has a little kiss of compression on a DBX160X. That is the single unit DBX160, and I'm probably getting one to three dB maximum compression, hardly anything at all. I just, it's part of the sound. I've loved the way that those have sounded on kick in. Most of my contemporaries, most of my friends use that particular uh, compressor on kick, just as a sideline. Um, and then next up is the Coles. Again, no EQ, no compression. So the only EQ and compression so far has been on the kick in. It's very typical for me. I use that to shape. That's my aggression, it's my snap. That's a little extra oomph. The other two, the FET and the coals are flat. Snare top is next up. And the snare top, 57 top, 57 bottom. Nothing going on on the bottom, printing completely flat, no EQ, no compression. The only EQ that's on the snare top is, I've got 3 dB at 100 hertz and 3 dB at 10K. But I'm also kissing, lightly tapping, this 11 is 76 over here. So a little bit of compression on that. Floor tom and rack tom, again, no EQ, no compression. I could have, quite often sometimes I'll boost 100 or even boost down as low, low as 50 
on the way in and then cut 400. However, he was using concert toms. He was using Vistalite toms with, when we, and even though we had a mic available for the bottom, as you can see here, it is muted. So, um, so even though we use that, it's not, not being used because there's no bottom head on it. He turned up with that. We'd already been set up, ready to go if you bought in regular toms. But as it is, it's just uh, a 421 on the top on both of those. And of course, the tom mics from the Shaw drum package. Okay, next up is a Mono 67. That's the mic against the wall on the inside facing towards this control room. You can see it out there. That is fun. That one I am crushing the schnizzle out of. I'm on the distressor over here, and there's a lot of compression going on, but with a super fast release. So it's, a, it's got a, a decent amount of attack. It's grabbing every single kick and snare, but it's releasing super fast. So when you listen to it back, when you listen to multitracks, you'll hear this very aggressive. Now, it's a little cymbal heavy because it's high up. I don't use it super loud. I'm not using it as a hi-fi mono room mic. I'm using it probably like, you know, if this is my kick and snare at zero dB here, I've got about this much going on. I use it just to add some energy underneath. It just adds excitement to the track, adds a bit of dirt, a bit of energy, like I said. Um, and so the distress is giving us a lot of that. It's a reflected mic. It's the 67 mic in the wall. Okay, a hi-hat is a 57 and a 451. Now, interestingly, with the 57, I am using a decent amount of gain and I'm pushing it pretty hard, but I'm riding my fader higher. Um, so it's just finding that sweet spot where, um, where I'm driving the mic pre, but I'm not driving it too hard so it sounds too aggressive. That's the thing about these mic pre's that I love is they distort, but in a very pleasing way. So you might click it and go hear too much of it and then click it down or click it here a little bit of it and then maybe you want to get a bit more and then bounce it with the fader because it's going from the fader to Pro Tools or to tape, whatever you're using. But it's going from fader there. So often you'll see my faders are hot on the console. And what does that mean? Well, that means I'm not driving my mic pre so hard because this is post mic pre. So what I might do is have a point where I want to print a decent hot signal, but I'm finding it, I'm hearing too much distortion. So I want to have it to be super clean. So I'll click back. So it's a fairly low mic pre gain and then drive it with my fader. Okay, next up is a 451. The 451, as you know, is an AKG condenser and I tape them together and then I blend the two. I usually, and I've been for quite a long time now, favoring 57s over condensers. In my studio, those of you who watched previous videos will know I don't even use a 57 and a, and a condenser. I actually use an SM7 just taped on there. So we're favoring, a 57 now is becoming my go-to on a hi-hat. Um, I don't want to hear sort of like super high endy hi hat. I want to hear, I want to hear that crunch. I want to hear the drive, the energy coming to push the song along. Overheads, no EQ, no compression. There's three overheads. We're blessed to have very expensive mics. There's three U67. So that's a good $30,000 worth of microphones just on the overheads. That's why our experiment with using the Shores is really important. I mean, we're, we're looking at $30,000 there on that. We're looking, I mean, there's probably a good fifty dollars to $60,000 worth of microphones just on the close mics. And then we have the rooms with the M149s and with high 87s. So you know, so there's about 70 grand's worth of microphones out there. So this is a big deal. You know, I know that that is going to make a difference. Nobody in their right mind is going to think that the expensive Neumanns and AKGs are not going to make a difference. Of course they are. But comparatively, it's about the room, the drums, and most importantly, the player. When you get a player like Blair, he's so balanced. He's going to sit there. He's going to play kick, kick, snare. Hat, hat. You know, he's not going to make the swash the hat so loud that it's all about the hats. He's not going to hit the cymbals so heavily that the kick and snare disappears. Um, I had a comment recently on a video talking about, oh, the drummer's not hitting the, the cymbals hard enough. It's like, no, I like that. If the drummer can, can play, play contained, can play kick and snare like this, you know, and then not hit the cymbals so hard, that's great because the room mics will respond better. The room mics will hear the kick and the snare and the cymbals will be inside of that drum sound, not sitting over the top and washing everything else out. 
Um, so these things are important. So yeah, M4, M49s, no EQ. Those are the high room mics pointing down. The low mics, the 87s, are on the ground. Now, next up is the bass. And again, no EQ, no compressional notes. The bass DI, the bass amp, no EQ on the bass. I could have done, but honestly, he came in with a 58p bass. He came in with foam under it and flat wound strings playing a very James Jameson kind of approach. And I wanted to preserve everything that was great about what he did. He also has, of course, the B15 flat um, flip top. And again, he has it set beautifully. Um, the, I did do other things with the DI though. I did a 160 DBX 160 into an 1176. And then I had a distressor on the amp. So I am compressing it lightly though. The amp in particular only has one or two dBs worth of compression. The way I do the DI is like I do a vocal. I go 160, tapping it, and then 1176, occasionally hitting the big peaks at 20 to 1, using it on limit. Okay, piano. There's a pair of U47s. We're throwing a lot of money at this. Those are very expensive mics. A pair of U47s on the piano. Then there's the mono piano mic, the C12A. That's my trick where I have that pointed in the frame. If you know when you'll go back and you see that part of the video where I talk about it, why we did it, it was actually at the studio in Studio Two when we were making the Thrills record with Dave Sardi. Okay, vocal. The vocal was an SM58. The vocal you hear on this recording, this is a live recording. The only thing we did is add a shaker and do some backgrounds on that U47 in there. Everything else about that song is completely live. And not only is it completely live, it is the first take. And it's not the first take after rehearsal, it's the first take. It is the band playing with the piano player and a singer. And they did maybe five or six takes, and I think we liked the last take and the first take. We came in here, and we all sat down and we listened to the last take and loved it, and we're like, this is the one. Let's just check out the first take. We went back and checked out the first take and went, no. The first take is magic because the first take, they evolve into the song. They're playing. It's starting a little slow. We printed it with no click. It built, it got to a, a crescendo and then it just resolved. It was just a beautiful moment that could only happen with musicians playing off each other and kind of flying by the seat of their pants. By the time we got to the sixth take, they kind of knew it. Everybody was confident and that's cool, but it didn't have that energy, that little kind of like edge that we love. Okay, and of course this last one here is the background vocal with the U47, which, because it's my vocal chain on a 47, I wanted the U47 because I wanted the breath in those backgrounds. We could have used the 58. And that was using the DB, DBX160 into an 1176. So there you have it. Um, the only other thing to mention, of course, and if you've seen the other video, is the Genelec. Genelec gave us these 1032 Cs to use. They are exactly the same speaker that I use in my studio every day, and actually the um, speakers that Sunset Sound have. Sunset Sound also own Genelex here. They have 1032s. What is unique about these is that they're the, um, what they call the SAM technology, which stands for, what does it stand for, Hayden? Read it off the back. Smart Active Monitor. It's a smart active monitor. So what that means is, and you'll watch the video with Stephanie talking about it, what it, what it does is they have a mic here, which is actually over here, behind these lights, that, uh, and you put it in the seating position, which is here, you know, where you're gonna be sitting 90% of the time, which is basically here with faders, and they will send out, uh, they will send out like a, you know, whatever, 20 hertz to 20K signal, and they sit down, they read the room. We close all the doors, we get into the perfect, the best kind of listening position you can, and then it calibrates the speaker for the room, which yesterday was, when we did this, was very, very revealing and very typical, very similar to my room. There was a kind of a build up at about 100, 150 hertz was the main thing. There were dips and cuts everywhere which you would expect, but a particular build up at one, 150, mainly around the 150 area. Why is that? because of this beautiful thing here. The consoles give you this kind of resonant buildup because, you know, they're a harder surface. It's very typical. If you, um, um, if you ever watched my Ulrich Wild video, Ulrich talked about that, about when he came to mix, um, 
pre this kind of technology, he said he would mix in studios and he would hear that low mid build up, or well, that low low and the low mid build up, and it would really bother him mixing on consoles. So when he came to his own environment, that's why he decided not to use consoles anymore. Because, you know, he's like, heck, why not? I'm gonna mix in the box. I'm not gonna have that build up from the console. And it's, it's a big deal. But with that technology, we were able to pull out that low frequency build up, and these are a lot flatter sounding than anywhere else. I mean, it's just really, really good. So totally wonderful. Um, other than that, um, that is our basic setup. Okay, so here I have both sets of drum mics in. It, as you can see, some of them are grayed out and that's because I'm obviously using just the same corresponding mics. We did a quick calculation. The whole drum mic package, I believe is $619 for all of the microphones. That's the seven that, that come in the package for sure. And then the two additional microphones, so it's $619. And the focus right is a thousand bucks. So for about sixteen, seventeen hundred dollars, we recorded all of these drums you're about to hear. Compared with, well, the eight, the sixty sevens alone on the overheads, well, one sixty seven is, I don't know, three or four times that much. So it's going to be very interesting to hear. Okay, so here are the low rooms, um, the the eighty sevens. Let's have a listen to those. Cool, so that is the low U87s. Let's go and listen to those PGs. I mean, I don't know about you guys, but I can hear a little extra brightness on the U87s, but it's pretty darn good. And in some ways that little darkness might help me out because then in a really heavy splashy drummer. I don't know, it's pretty darn close. Now that the levels are similar. So this is the pair of U87s low down. Here's the Shure $89 mics. Pretty darn good. Um, Okie dokie. Let's go, I mean, $89 as opposed to three or $4,000. Okay, so let's go up and now you'll see I've got some VMR action going on and I'll show you why in a second. So this is the kick in. This is a D112. Now, if you remember, I did EQ and compress this because I want a great recording. So I wasn't doing this from the point of view of trying to dumb it down. So there's a lot of 50 boosts did some 400 hertz out. Now let's go to, that is the natural sound of the sure inexpensive kick in. No EQ, no compression. So here's the VMR, here's the Slate plugins. Little bit of compression. Take it off. Little bit of 50 boosted here. Let's go to 400. Go back to the kick in. Now, with the kick-in microphones, I really strongly say that you've got, we had one mic, the D112, in the exact position I wanted to, and then the other shore, the cheap shore, sorry, had to be a little bit on the outside, and it, it got a little bit more of the sound of the oh, the resonance of the drum. So if you listen, as a result, I mean, that proximity, listen to this, it's sort of ringing a little bit too much, in a perfect world, I'd put a transient designer on that.
It's much, much tighter. I think that's got a lot to do with the proximity. There was no way we could have those mics be in exactly the same place. Um, I do like the tightness of the D112, but if I was to run a transient design, I'd be very happy. So I'm still really, I'm very happy with the results of the uh, inexpensive one there. Okay, so this one was the one that actually got me quite a lot was the snare. So if we listen to the snare, here's a 57, which in itself isn't a particularly expensive microphone. So, a little quieter, not a lot. There's a tiny bit more Christmas and low mid in the 57. Again, might be proximity, but definitely a difference. So I'm gonna turn the VMR stuff on. That's nice. So what have I done? On the FGN here, I've boosted a little 110. Give me, it says 2 dB, 2.27, and I'm boosting about 3 dB of 7.2K. Maybe a little, maybe I'm doing a little bit too much high boost. Just bring that down a bit. It's pretty darn similar. So it just goes to show, now obviously a 57 is not an expensive mic. But you know, that whole drum package of like 400 bucks is pretty insane. Um, okay, so we're starting to really get through these. Um, let's go next to overheads. This is really where it gets expensive because we have a pair of U67s measured in phase with the snare, going through a Sunset Sound console, which is one of the best sounding consoles ever made. And that's made Prince Records and you name it. So here is the U67s. Sounds good. This is the inexpensive mics. Go back to the expensive mics. Definitely some more low lows. I mean, hello, bleeding Luya. I mean, I love U67s. Um, and when given an opportunity to use them, of course I'll use them anywhere. But the difference is pretty minimal in many respects. Okay, so what's next? Next is the Tom mics. Okay, so we're going to take this little Tom fill and we're going to compare. Okay, so. Here is the, here's the 421s. I mean, I like the rack tom more. There's a little bit more bottom end coming out of that floor tom, but it also looks like it's printing ever so slightly quieter. So let's bring that up. I'm trying to balance the volumes as much as possible. Let's get the panning close. So this is the inexpensive shores going through the focus right. Here is four twenty ones Sunset Sound console. I mean, it's so close. It's ridiculous. It's unbelievably ridiculous how close those are. It really does go to show how much of it is the tuning of the drums, the performance from the drummer, and a great room. It's not all just 
the you know hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of equipment. Okay, so let's do full kit. So this is the Sunset Sound. It's a combination of U67s, U87s, um, D112, 57s, and 421s. Okay, here is the Shure Focusrite. Back to the sunset. Back to the shore focus right. I mean, I, I played this earlier to everybody in the room and I told them as a blind test, which one did they prefer? And not knowing what I was doing, they all actually preferred the Focusrite Shure drum package. Now, whether that's right or wrong, I don't really want to argue, but I think we're making a, a point here is that it really is drummer, drums, performance orientated. That's gonna make more of a difference than anything else because this is exactly the same performance with just with double mics. $1,800 or less worth of $1,700 worth of equipment gets you this result. That's seventeen hundred dollars total. Focus right and sure mics. With some tiny EQ done on kick and snare, which was comparable to what we had done using the Sunset Sound Gear.
I hope you enjoyed the video. I hope you enjoyed everything about it. It's, it's a real blessing to work with somebody as talented as Jonah Smith, um, who writes such beautiful songs. And frankly, obviously having Blair Sinter, who's a good old friend of mine playing drums, a phenomenal drummer. And then John Button, as you know, is the currently the Who's bass player. You know, when you've got players that good, you're always going to get these kind of results. So you're going to get a one take, a first take of a song, be that good. So download the files, enjoy it, mix them, do whatever you like. Excited to hear what you did. You're going to get to hear the drum files. You can take the focus right ones and put them in it. It's going to be really, really amazing. So thank you ever so much for watching. Please leave a bunch of comments and questions below. Have a marvelous time recording and mixing, and I'll see you all again very soon.